uh, I may may I request Dr. Kesh Mohan to give his welcome remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Janakaraj. Uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, be asked to uh, give the welcome remarks. Uh, I'm uh, President Emeritus now of the CSEP. Uh, president, of course, is Lavish Pandari, who you can see, I think, on the screen. Um, so let me give a warm welcome to all the Zoom participants first. Um, and uh, then our main speaker, Vinod Thomas, um, and our generous discussants, Sunita Narayan and Olivia Jensen from Singapore. And I'm currently in New York. So this is a truly international uh, Zoom or international uh, webinar. Um, it uh, also shows that we are saving a lot on uh, air miles and not polluting the planet by doing this. So between uh, Singapore and New York and Delhi. Of course, it would have been much nicer if we were all together in Bali or somewhere. Uh, that would be much nicer to actually do this. So let me first, so my job mainly is uh, to welcome all of you, but I, I'm extending that job by introducing my old friend, uh, Vinod Thomas. He's a friend and also old, but also an old friend. Uh, the We have been co-conspirators and co-workers to some extent ever since we joined the World Bank in 1976. And both of us started our careers in urban economics and urban development. Uh, and both of us have strayed quite far uh, from where we started. But I think in the current context of climate change, we need to come back and focus our attentions much more, and this time perhaps together, on what cities have to do, uh, how cities have to be transformed to cope with climate change. Um, he has he is probably the most prolific author that the World Bank has ever had. Um, when I was there until 1986, we used to compete on who would produce the most publications. Uh, now I find that he has won hands down uh, because he has authored 17 books and I have not reached double digits. Uh, so I have a lot of work to do now to catch up with him. Um, Vinod has exhibited uh, incredible uh, diversity in his work. Um, he is now, of course, uh, uh, devoting his uh, considerable energies uh, towards the crucial issue of our existence, really. It's, an, it's, a, it's a challenge of existence for the world, which is the challenge of climate change and what we all do to avert what could be a catastrophe, much of which we've also seen in the past couple of years uh, in different places. Um, he is really passionate about the actions uh, needed to mitigate and adapt uh, uh, to climate change, um, very serious and uh, has been in some sense almost like a messiah uh, on this issue, which uh, I hope that he continues uh, doing, um, as of course is Sunita Narayan and of course Olivia uh, on the same issue. Um, I won't give away his presentation, but I do want to pose my first question, which you can answer when you finish. Um, how, that you're making lots of proposals, as you will see, uh, after a very hard analysis. The question mainly is how to make realistic your policy prescriptions or the feasibility of actions and policies and also the funding involved. And if I may make one comment on that, which is that if one uh, makes uh, suggestions or policy prescriptions for action and funding and so on, which is way beyond everyone's capacity, um, the people may not do anything. And that's a real danger. I always remember a path-breaking paper from I think 1958 of someone called Holland Hunter, who was at Haverford College, called the optimal tautness of development planning. And the main idea there was that you always have to uh, aim higher than what you think can be done. 
but not so much higher that everything breaks down. So I think that's the context. Um, we know this currently the visiting senior fellow at the Institute for the Southeast Asian Studies in Singapore. Uh, he was just, I guess, till earlier this year, a visiting professor at the Lee Kuan Yew School uh, of Public Policy at, at the NUS, National University of Singapore, um, to which also Olivia belongs. Um, he's a former director general of ADB, uh, of the Independent Evaluation Group, and the same thing, director general of the World Bank for Independent Evaluation Group. So I guess he was evaluating these institutions for almost like 10 years. And again, at the end of your talk, Virod, you can also tell us what impact you had in after evaluating these institutions, or have they changed at all? Did they listen to you at all in both of these uh, institutions? Um, he was also a uh, senior vice president uh, when he was the director general of the World Bank Independent Russian Group. Uh, he was also prior to that vice president of the World Bank Institute, which is the, um, uh, the, the sort of training arm of the World Bank. I guess that doesn't exist anymore, um, as I understand. Um, the also chief economist for East Asia, and among other places, he also worked in Brazil. So he really spanned the globe, except that Africa seems to have escaped his eye uh, through his career. So maybe even though now he should move to Nairobi or somewhere uh, from Singapore. Um, but his main achievement, uh, most important thing he has, is that he's a member of the advisory group on climate change for CSEP. Uh, so that's really his most important assignment that he has ever had. Um, so among his uh, key achievements, uh, he was the lead author for the World Development Report in 1991 called Challenge of Development. And uh, I had forgotten that it was 1991 that he did that. But that, of course, was when we changed our overall economic policy in India the same year. So we took up his challenge immediately, or maybe he took up the challenge after we had done our reforms so that other would follow us uh, in, in economic reforms for development. Um, among his 17 books, um, the, the, the quality of growth in, in 2000, multi-development banks and the development process, two, climate change and natural disasters in 2017, and another book on economic evaluation in 2019, of course, the latest one that we are discussing today. Um, so I'll close there, except one, since I'm in New York City, uh, to comment that one thing that you could do a major impact uh, of mitigation of climate change would be if you can uh, force the United States to have a regulation to limit the volume or the size of coffee cups. Uh, because even the small coffee cups here, I can't drink more than a quarter or a third. Just imagine all the water, the energy, and everything saved. If you can, if you can just do one thing, we will believe that you have impact. We know. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rakesh. I'm overwhelmed uh, by that introduction. And it's really, truly a great pleasure to share this uh, platform with you. And also my esteemed uh, colleagues, Sunita, Olivia, Janak, and Lavish, thank you for uh, organizing this as well. Um, um, I guess given the limited amount of time on such a vast topic, um, I'll go fairly fast uh, using the slides, but one quick um, take on Rakesh's very thoughtful comments right at the beginning. Uh, you know, the numbers are just staggering. The problem is really out of reach in many ways. Uh, so within that, how does one have a game plan, if not implementation of that, that is realistic and even achievable and people don't give up? Uh, I go around in circles on this issue and at the end of the day, come back to the thinking that although people say it's political will and if there is the political will, things will happen, it really comes down to public opinion. If there was public opinion, a groundswell of public opinion and a pressure for change, we have seen some dramatic things happening over our lifetimes, everything from abolition of slavery to women's rights, et cetera, et cetera. 
and the financing and technology will follow. That's my thinking. But nevertheless, today we will give some numbers on the financing and technology uh, and uh, almost mechanically go through some of that just to get a sense of what is involved. So if it's okay, um, I, I will um, start, but again, by thanking CSEP for the uh, actually great leadership in um, working on climate change and other issues, of course, uh, with uh, a tremendous sense of urgency and original papers, which have actually moved the needle uh, within India and beyond already. So uh, that, is, that is absolutely great. Um, and climate change sometimes makes us feel numb. The numbers are, I mean, they're headline news all the time. And uh, at times we may even think uh, on a nice day when it is nice outside that this problem is futuristic. But if you listen to IPCC or any other um, serious observer, we are on the brink of crossing the 1.5 degrees centigrade, which really means catastrophic warming. And in that context is public opinion and how we feel about it is a big part of the equation. Then this seminar and seminars like this are not just talk shops, it's part of really moving the needle on this issue. So with that, let me just quickly go to the share screen mode and see if I can get this going uh, fairly quickly. And uh, this, uh, this presentation, of course, would be available. Uh, and I also want to thank the wonderful participants. Uh, a lot of you have been able to join today, I sense. And um, these, this PowerPoint presentation would be available to you as well. Um, so uh, the focus on risk and resilience in the book, uh, in a way, generalizes the story, uh, but then the focus very much goes very quickly to climate change. We are really in a poly crisis, everything from food prices to youth unemployment to the war in Ukraine and uh, uh, the dangers of AI, health pandemic, and then of course, climate change that cuts across all of this. And one change that is happening is that rather than looking at climate change as a self-standing issue, how it cuts across all of these and has cascading effect is really part of uh, how we might uh, get to a solution uh, in time. The one message from the book, uh, it's almost um, ironic that you have to uh, say that climate change is real, uh, that it is human caused, and that action might make a difference because it's human caused. It was, if it was entirely natural, uh, then good economics might suggest that you wait and see what happens because you might get it all wrong. But if it is human caused, that is the economic rationale for acting, both on adaptation and mitigation. And uh, the super wickedness, uh, as this has been known for some time. Uh, and uh, um, when we look at it today, um, the, it should leave no doubt in people's minds. Uh, 2023 was arguably the most extreme year on weather issues that we have ever seen. These 15 tipping points uh, pointed out in this uh, graph are real, uh, uh, highly um, peer reviewed paper uh, that uh, talks about these tipping points very much on the verge of becoming realities. In India, of course, um, the year 2023 really marked a climax both on the side of floods and storms and heat waves and drought conditions. Uh, this picture, I guess you go left to right, um, just gives a, a, a snapshot of some of the extreme events. What is striking is that, say, take the last picture on Delhi, um, <clears throat> July 9th, 9th uh, 2023 saw the highest 24 degree uh, hour uh, rainfall of 153 millimeters. The same year, May 21st, had seen 
42.9 degrees centigrade. Um, so extreme heat and extreme uh, floods. And the significance of that is if you are in the business of disaster management, uh, what is needed, capacity, financing, skills, all, all of the above are quite varied and bringing them together uh, is, is a huge challenge. The big question would be, if some of these events were to repeat more than what we saw in 23, 23, uh, 2023, uh, then all bets are off. And that is the challenge uh, to be uh, dealt with. Now, the economics of how to deal or what to do about it at the global level, um, the numbers speak for themselves in the sense that if I were to summarize this uh, series of numbers presented here, it comes down to saying that, yes, there is a cost of acting. And here it's very much on the mitigation side, preventing. Uh, but the cost of not doing so are about five times and higher. So that's the global thing. That's so this global mitigation, not by an individual country. <clears throat> uh, given that um, uh, the case for global action on climate change obviously uh, comes out very, very straightforward. It's the distribution of that action that becomes much trickier. In that context, uh, the blue box uh, draws attention to the fact that even if the benefits are so huge, they accrue over time, but the costs are immediate, uh, they need to be borne. And so the trade-off or the contrast of that with other expenditures, such as straightforward um, poverty reduction on different levels, that really comes to the table. But here, as every year passes, uh, the dilemma uh, sort of gets subsumed into the reality of climate change when one third of Pakistan goes underwater and fires erase the size of Germany from the face of Canada through forest fires. The distinction between poverty reduction and climate mitigation, they begin to collapse. They become one and the same. There can't be much poverty reduction if the uh, mitigation, which uh, without mitigation, uh, the harm to especially poor communities and poor countries are, are going to balloon. One thing I'll add uh, to the headline of this segment, which is uh, the super wickedness of climate change. Whereas we have seen that in many problems, um, there is also, along with policy, a natural tendency to converge to a solution. Um, for instance, um, uh, the, even in the case of the tragedy of the commons, a uh, very tough issue, um, Eleanor Rostrom showed that if um, communities were empowered and uh, some institutional solutions are added to that, there is a tendency for uh, people to get together and figure out ways in which fishing can be a bit more sustainable than otherwise. And, you know, we have everyday examples of the economics working out, uh, creating the supply when the prices go very high. But in the case of climate change, the picture on the left says that there is a tendency to go the opposite way. Extreme weather, warming raises energy needed for cooling, higher demand, lower supply, and therefore use of more fossil fuels, warming goes uh, even higher. Or forest fires on the one side, uh, leading to greater warming, and warming makes the forest fires that much more deadly. So this divergence uh, is what makes this a uh, super, super wicked problem. And in this context, just a quick, I mean, this picture itself uh, needs some time, but just to say that while in the case of many problems, we can go at them one at a time. And so the left side of the panel, uh, which is a sensitivity analysis, some things that even central bankers would do, um, <clears throat> is something that we, we could have done. Uh, that is, if instead of uh, one uh, flood uh, once a year, 
in uh, 20 years takes place like say in Himachal Pradesh, but what if it were to repeat every year? Um, that is a sensitive analysis of the capability uh, to withstand that stress. But for climate change, when it interacts, when heat waves interacts with uh, viral outbreaks and with crop failure and financial collapse, as uh, insurance companies go under, uh, it could really lead to a collapse of the financial system. That cascading effect calls for, and this is on the right side of the ledger, uh, the scenario testing. So we have some real uh, work to do to go from sensitivity and analysis to scenario testing to see whether uh, these uh, multiple uh, threats can be withstood. Um, Janak, how am I doing? How much time do I have? I mean, you can take another five, seven minutes, no problem. Yeah. Okay, so the second segment, and we had three, so the second segment uh, is on this message that we need to do both adaptation and mitigation. Uh, the RBI report on this is, uh, is quite powerful, and uh, you might take a look at that. But on adaptation, there are low cost solutions. Uh, here are some pictures from Maharashtra, from Kerala on housing. And uh, the one on the housing at the bottom is now becoming a very uh, prevalent approach in Asia of leaving the ground floor <clears throat> um, uh, empty uh, uh, for water to flow through and uh, locate uh, on higher floors, et cetera. And those could be considered low cost but very effective solutions on the adaptation side. But then when countries and coastal areas are looking at the challenges ahead, very capital intensive solutions also are being practiced. Tokyo's flood tunnel, Singapore's plans for seawalls and the spawn cities of absorbing water, moisture and then releasing them over time. All of those are credible, but very expensive options. One thing though, even with these options becoming clear is that say the spawn cities based on data from previous years are proving to be far too insufficient for the deadly uh, flooding and storms that are taking place in China uh, in, the, in say in 2023. The same thing with Tokyo's uh, incredible flood uh, tunnels the game plan so far is not going to do it beyond a few years. And so the plan is afoot for uh, reinforcing that with additional expenditures. Um, so to conclude this segment, um, um, the adaptation side <clears throat> clearly has a big role and the financing for that really falls short. Uh, but Quickly, we also realized that while shortfalls on adaptation can be found, uh, we also are learning that all the adaptation in the world will not be enough if climate change is not mitigated. And the mitigation shortfalls are even bigger than the adaptation shortfalls, not necessarily in the financing sense, but on what is, needs to be done. So this picture, uh, probably speaks for himself, itself, uh, noting that the highly insufficient according to the climate tracker is all over the map. Um, so coming back to India on this one, on, on mitigation, um, and uh, I cite here also the uh, very current or ongoing paper from uh, Montek and uh, Patel. Um, th there is the 2070 plan, and if you took what I said earlier seriously, then 2050, 2060, 2070, those are non-starters in terms of the years by which we achieve net, net zero, um, because we are already very late on the uh, impact climate change is going to have. And so if we were to imagine a 2050 net zero, what will it take? One way or the other, we seem to come back around a figure, something like four to five percent of GDP, and in this case, it's future GDP. So it's a it's a pretty hefty number. 
uh, a year of investment seems to be what it takes. Uh, and this is way above anything we have at the moment uh, to mitigate. And plus, along with that, great progress on cap carbon capture, uh, nuclear as well, hydrogen and EVs, uh, the third bullet, all of that needs to accompany that. So clearly uh, it's a huge task, but just to be uh, frank about this, 2050 net zero is about what it takes as the minimum needed to avoid more than say two degrees. And maybe it's already too late to imagine that, but I put this up as a stretch goal uh, on what is uh, needed. Now, um, to come to the third segment, which is kind of related to Rakesh's original question. Uh, these numbers are huge, no question about it. And uh, very few countries, rich and poor, are in a position to uh, reach those. I mentioned that adaptation shortfalls are huge, but all if you had only done adaptation, according to a very interesting paper from 2009, uh, it won't make any difference after a certain point because um, the um, need for additional adaptation, it's, it's like having a bigger and bigger bucket to collect the water from the uh, leak of the roof. Uh, you just got to fix the roof uh, or stop the leakage. So that mitigation cost uh, is something we cannot escape anymore. Maybe we could have. Uh, there's a very interesting uh, book um, that, uh, that uh, um, uh, Amitav Bosch had done on uh, great derangement, which says maybe uh, if, if, if Asia had industrialized 100 years ago, um, this problem would have arisen much earlier and solutions uh, might have been found by now, uh, but, or it could have gone the other way, but whatever it is, uh, we are where we are. And so the mitigation needs are really uh, um, something we cannot escape. But technology and finance at the end of the day, I, I believe will follow if there is a groundswell of public opinion. And uh, here, Das Gupta's book uh, on biodiversity last year uh, really tells a story that at the bottom of it all, it is the valuation and pricing that is problematic. If we take GDP, G being gross, as the be all and end all, then destruction adds to GDP. And that then uh, leads to a whole set of uh, factors that favor any kind of growth, fuel, fossil fuel subsidies that generate momentum and growth, uh, uh, that is polluting growth, um, would be okay. Um, so the first thing to do is to get rid of the fo fossil fuel subsidies. And uh, here, even MDBs are in the business of financing uh, some of that, even through trade financing. Uh, but then also going further, and Davish probably will uh, say something more on this, so I will be very, very brief, going from subsidization of polluting fuels, um, um, taxing them, and then adding to that subsidies for renewables is sound economics. How well it's implemented and how it is devoid of uh, extreme corruption and other uh, uh, problems uh, remains on the table as a big issue. But the case for carbon pricing and the case for a carbon tax is extremely strong. And would this not be an area, particularly for countries like India and Singapore for different reasons, are at a very difficult starting point on decarbonizing overnight. Let the market do the trick, uh, the work, and generate um, opportunities that you had not anticipated by simply making it difficult to use uh, polluting fuels. So there's a lot to be said on this, but I will skip this fairly quickly. And then uh, uh, probably this is the penultimate slide. Um, say a word about biodiversity and forest because it's really literally almost a, a low hanging fruit where, <clears throat> um, 
the valuation of natural capital, which I started by saying is really at the, uh, at the root of the problem, uh, can be reversed. And India would be in a very, very, very strong uh, position uh, to protect the forests, protect biodiversity. Um, and um, here, the, uh, you know, the, um, the recent change in uh, a policy is a big question mark. Uh, afforestation targets are good, but amending the Forest Conservation Act uh, could worsen deforestation, uh, not by virtue of what the headlines would say, but by virtue of some of the details that are embedded in that act. Uh, so this is something to be watched because at the end of the day, uh, reversing deforestation and protecting uh, is really the best form of carbon sink uh, and uh, carbon uh, storage that uh, we could imagine. Um, so with that, let me close, um, Janak, and say, just say that at the end of the day, uh, focusing on the quality of growth, rather than uh, including the valuation of natural capital, rather than the gross quantity, could have been the fundamental answer uh, to getting to a better place. Um, and at the same time, we are in the real world, so financing for mitigation and adaptation need to be stepped up. Uh, we will probably in the discussion period get to what the multilateral development banks need to do. Roughly speaking, uh, out of a hundred dollars additional investment, two thirds probably will have to come from domestic sources, but a third uh, would have to come from the external sources. And that uh, is way above what uh, these banks are currently doing. So a major reformulation of their mandate and financing and head, led, head, head rule, and then again, linking to Rakesh's question, having all that won't do, the evaluation needs to show also that the money is being well spent. And there are question marks on that as well. But once this is done, we would then need to front load these investments. Here, the good economics would be that earlier you spend the better because partly you have more time uh, to reap the benefits. And two, given the nature of the cascading climate crisis, um, the problem gets that much worse later. The only qualification would be that technology might present new things down the road. But that said, the second bullet is clearly in favor of front-loading climate investments. And, um, at the end of the day, the hope is that if that's the way to go, then Midas would be an um, a early starter and Asia could gain a competitive advantage in agriculture, energy, transport, et cetera, with a decisive shift to renewables and low carbon growth. Uh, this is the book. Thank you very much for your attention and I very much look forward to our wonderful commentators. Yeah, uh, thank you, Vinod. Thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. You have really summed up beautifully the whole book in three messages. Now to discuss the key points of this book, I have with me a panel of three distinguished guests. Uh, my first panelist is Sunita Narayan. She's arguably India's best well-known environmentalist. She currently serves as, a, as the Director General of the New Delhi-based influential think tank Center for Science and Environment. She's also the editor of the fortnightly magazine Down to Earth. Through her research and advocacy, she has been in influential in building public opinion on the challenges and solutions for the environment, particularly for countries in the global south. She has over four decades of in-depth research experience relating to the governance and management of the environment. Sunita Narayan is one of the 31 experts appointed by the UAE to the advisory board for the upcoming COP28 Climate Summit in November, December 2023. Uh, in 2016, Sunita Narayan was named as 100 most influential people in the list of Times Magazine. She was a member of the Prime Minister's Council for Climate Change from 2007 to 2014. For her distinguished work in the area of environment, she was awarded the Padma Shri by the Government of India in 2005. Very warm welcome to Sunita Narayan. My second, you. my second panelist is Olivia Jensen. 
She's an economist and public policy scholar specializing in water and environmental policy with a focus on urban Asia. She is deputy director and lead scientist environment and climate at the LRF Institute for the Public Understanding of Risk, IPO, National University of Singapore. Before joining the Institute for the Public uh, undertake, uh, Understanding of Risk, she was senior research fellow at the Institute of Water Policy at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore. She is the author of numerous authoritative reports, academic papers, and articles on risk perceptions and risk communications, water policy, and governance, and also economics, economic and environmental regulation. She has experience in academia, consultancy, media, and the non-government sector, and has led projects for public and institutional clients, including the World Bank and OECD. Her current projects include collaborative assessment of urban water risks, public and experts' perceptions of climate risk and responses, and the design of interventions to close these perception gaps. She holds PhD and MSc degrees from the London School of Economics and MA degree from the Oxford University. Welcome, Olivia. My third panelist is my colleague, Lavish Bandari. He is the president and senior fellow at the CSEP. He has been leading climate change and sustainability research at the CSEP and has published widely on subjects relating to sustainable livelihoods, industrial economic and social reforms in India, economic geography and financial inclusion. He has taught economics at the Boston University and IIT Delhi. He has been the managing editor of the Journal of Emerging Market Finance and worked at the National Council of Applied Economic Research, a well-known think tank based in New Delhi. Welcome, Lavish. Now, uh, before we proceed further, uh, I would just briefly explain the you know, ground rules so that we make most of this time today. Uh, after this, I will ask each panelist to make, uh, to give their perspectives for about seven to eight minutes. And after that, we will take up a few questions from the audience. And I would request all those participants who want to ask questions to our panelists, please be very, very brief and indicate the name of the panelist to whom you want to address the question. And please also ensure that the question is relating to the theme of the discussion we are having today. So may I now turn to my first panelist, uh, uh, Sunita Narayan, to give her perspectives Thank you, Janak, and uh, thank you so much, Vinod, for such a fascinating overview and in-depth uh, presentation in terms of the way ahead. Um, so my would be to, to reflect on what you have said and perhaps to, uh, to share with you uh, where, we, where I see also the opportunity to move ahead. Uh, you're absolutely clear we're in an existence. We're absolutely clear also that we have run out of time. We have also run out of the carbon budget. By 2030, at the current rates, we will, be, we will have no carbon budget left to keep the world below 1.5 degrees centigrade rise. And this at a time when 70% of the world would still not have access to development or energy. Now that's the real fundamental crisis when it comes to climate change, because if the rich polluted in the past, the poor will pollute in the future. And that we are already seeing by till 20, till, till early 2000, if you look at the graph, all the emissions in the world had come from the already developed world. From 2000, when China joined WTO, you see a spike coming in, and then China's emissions take over today, are today double of what the United States produces on an annual basis, not on a per capita, but on an annual basis. By 2030, China will equate um, with the US in terms of even per capita emissions. Now, the entire continent of Africa, countries like India need growth, and we have run out of the carbon budget. Now, this is where we can, 
we can we can cry over all the spilt milk of the past we should have acted we should have made sure that for the last three decades the un uh, agreement that the rich will reduce and the poor will grow and there will be money and technology so that they grow differently that crucial agreement of 1992 we did too little but the question is there's no point in crying about the past the question and you so rightly have put down what do we do in the future now this is where to me um the solutions that you have put forward are really um answers that we should be looking at as we move ahead because these are not these are what i call the call the co-benefit solutions these are solutions which are good for us and they will also be good for the world so if you look at water and sewage something that i'm sure olivia knows so well uh, today we have climate change is really about water it's about getting excess water and too little water. Uh, but the opportunity here is to make sure, as you showed very clearly, um, the entire systems of uh, India, which were based on lakes and ponds. I mean, we can call them the sponge cities of the future, but that's really what they were all about. The fact that we created space for water to go, this for the drainage systems of our cities. But we have built over them. We forgot the fact that we would need local water resources. Now, if we were to reinvent those, go back to those, they will also help us in recharging groundwater, cutting the cost of water supply to our cities. And they also become spaces for sewage management. They also become spaces which help to cool our urban spaces, because at the end of the day, Thermal comfort is not about smart appliances or expensive appliances. It's about buildings, buildings that are affordable and cities which are livable. And that's really where the science of adaptation cannot be a newfangled technocratic science. It has to be built on the principle of affordability and inclusiveness of large numbers of people who are going to have to deal with this. It's the same with, um, with mobility transformation. And you know, the rest of the world, the entire world is chasing individual e-vehicles. Um, I'm glad that in India, there is an understanding that we need to invest in e-buses, but we are still not doing it at the scale and pace that is needed. But a transformation in our mobility system will also reduce our air pollution. And that's really where the co-benefits come for our part of the world. Um, CSC has just done two reports, one on the steel, iron and steel industry, the other on the cement industry, two hard to abate sectors. And we have shown the way that we can go ahead in terms of reducing emissions and yet growing. And a lot of it has to do with making sure that we can use more and more. We are much more resource uh, efficient in terms of using this uh, materials that were scrapped, that were not used. So the long and short of it is, we you know, that I really do believe that your, your positioning that we need to be able to move towards uh, mitigation and resilience is something that we need to work towards and we can do. I'll give you another example, the whole question about Manrega and agriculture. I mean, I really believe uh, that India's most, the world's most important adaptation program today is the Mahatma Gandhi Rural Employment Program. Uh, we did, just did a story out of uh, Rajasthan, where instead of the floods that we were expecting to see, we saw this amazing effort of communities which had used the Manrega assets to refurbish them, restore them, to be able to hold every drop of water. And that unseasonal rain, which would have become uh, destructive for the crops, has actually become productive for them. So, I mean, there are these huge opportunities we have. 
The question I think we know that you asked and we need to discuss is why is this not happening? Why is it not happening at the scale and pace that we need it to happen? Why is it not happening across the world? Forget just us, but across the world. And I think there are three key reasons for this. One, I think it's about, and I'm sorry, this is where we really need to understand that we are so hesitant to look at scaling up innovative solutions. Uh, we still look at them as things that can happen on the sideline, but they won't happen as a whole. I mean, Singapore's entire experiment with um, the mobility system, Delhi's experiment with its compressed natural gas system, they came in spite of the opposition. And the, the effort, it wasn't an opposition because of money, it was an opposition because of mindset. There is a complete, um, mindset which opposes any change. You cannot believe, you know, how tough it is to get in India today, the idea of non sewer sanitation growing in our cities. It's not an opposition from politicians. It's not an opposition. It's an opposition from technocrats. It's an opposition from engineers. It's an opposition from economists. It's the people who are steeped in conventional thinking and conventional ideas. And in spite of all their understanding of climate change, they would still like to fiddle on the sides and not do anything substantive. And that's really the crisis that I believe that we are dealing with today. That's one. The second, of course, is finance. Rakesh raised that right at the beginning. But I, like you, believe finance is available. If there is a push, if there is a public uh, demand, finance will be available. Today, uh, whether it was the war, finance was available. I think Janak is telling me to shut up, and I will at this last point to say, finance clearly is something that doesn't bother me. I think it's the approach, the ideas, and the question of equity. Because at the end of the day, I don't see enough action in the world that needs to act. You talked about net zero of 2050, but the fact is there's not a single country in the world that has a roadmap for 2050, which is credible where they are on track. So before we talk about India, we need to do it for our own reasons. We need the rest of the world to step up their game. And what UK press prime minister has done right now just tells us the real politics scores. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sunita. Uh, you make a very good point that no, there's no point in crying over split milk, and we will come come back to this point uh, you know, later. And of course, uh, you have also mentioned that finance is not a problem. You bring a very different perspective to the table, and we'd like to discuss more uh, after the other two panelists have made uh, you know uh, their points. So may I now turn to Olivia to give her perspectives? Certainly. Thank you, Janak. Um, um, I'm really in very eminent company here. So I was just thinking about how I might also find a way to contribute to the, this, this discussion. And Vinod's book and his, his presentation, I mean, almost all the points you make, Vinod, I wholeheartedly agree with. Um, and I'm very grateful that you took the time with this sort of this patient, this very patient, very thorough book. Um, to bring together all the scholarly work that's being done on this and to put it all in one place. And now it's very useful for the rest of us to refer to. Um, my work um, that I'm, I'm focusing on at the moment touches quite a bit on the public perception side. So I thought I would pick up on um, one of Vinod's points, which was that what all this really requires is a groundswell of public opinion and, and talk a little bit to that. Because I'm not, I'm not totally sure that we do need um, more uh, public opinion behind the recognition that uh, we're in a climate crisis. Um, we've got a, a great uh, resource in um, a global poll that uh, covered more than 100,000 people, um, 100 countries and 1,000 people in each country. And one of the questions in that um, world risk poll was, um, do you perceive climate change to be a serious risk to the people of your country 
in the next 20 years? And, and people resoundingly said yes. And that was not a um, that was not exclusive to high income countries um, by any means. Um, a couple of the countries where uh, the rates of people saying that they perceived it to be a high risk that come out um, come out on top include um, Malawi and Lesotho in in, in sub Saharan Africa, um, and we see that you know across across regions that some you know low income countries, which you might expect people there to have other concerns at the top of their minds. Um, what people, ordinary people recognize the urgency of, of climate as a risk to climate change, as a risk to people in their country. Um, but what's the problem? Well, this, the sticking point is that if you ask people then, well, what's the biggest risk to you? Hardly anybody says climate change. Um, and even if you ask them, what's the biggest risk to your country? Hardly anybody says climate change people come back to standard concerns about um, the economy, mainly about employment, inflation, the cost of living. Um, people might talk about crime and violence, especially in Latin America, and, and the absolute sort of most mundane and ordinary risk of all traffic and road accidents is the one that comes out absolutely on top in people's concerns. And then when you think about this at the level of the individual, you think, but we can't we ask people to put climate change at the top of their list of risks. We're each of us facing this spectrum of risks in our daily lives. And the more we're resource constrained, the, the harder it is to manage those risks. And we're asking people on top of that to say that climate change, this, um, this, this abstract, uh, difficult to understand, in some, in some senses, kind of a scientific rather than a um, a felt uh, risk is the one that they should prioritize. That's a very difficult argument to make. And, and so I would veer away a little bit from putting the onus on public opinion to, uh, to drive the change and put the onus right back on policymakers. Because it seems to me that our political leaders are the ones who are in a position to influence public opinion they're also the ones who are able to take that kind of collective, uh, the collective view and put climate change further up the policy agenda where it deserves to be. So this, the second um, sort of nuance I would add to your, to your arguments, Vinod, is um, to place national policies squarely at the center of our discussion, because all the things that are going to lead us to achieving um, net zero or to controlling runaway climate change are going to be decided at the national level. Now, of course, that international context is important. Um, and the international negotiations are something that we should, must pay attention to. But um, all the decisions that matter are going to be made at the national level. So if we ask then, well, what is it that people, voters, um, activists are willing to support or are likely to protest against in terms of, of national policies. Um, and we've been reviewing um, a great big set of, of papers, sort of 200 papers, which have been written over the course of the last five, 10 years on people's public attitudes towards different climate policies. And there's some things that come out of that, which I think are, are, are quite useful. And one of them is that people's support for policies at the national level tends not to depend on what other countries are doing. So people have, have looked at this um, both in kind of survey type questions um, and also in experimental settings and asked, um, you know, you're from, you're from China. If you know that the US is, um, is, is taking much more stringent, uh, stringent regulations on its carbon emissions, um, does that make you more likely to support stringent regulations at home? And that doesn't seem to make a difference to people's level of support. I think that's very interesting. And it maybe suggests that sometimes we focus a little bit too much on this kind of collective action problem at the international level. And we forget that what drives policy support mainly is what's going on at the national level and how people feel about, um, ab about who's in charge um, and the kinds of policies that they're implementing. 
And so what are the kinds of things that people support? Well, we also know quite a lot about, about that. And of course, nobody likes tax. So the economist's answer to, the, to, to this problem, which is institute a carbon tax, because that will provide the right incentives, um, turns out to be a very difficult sell at the political level. Um, however, um, we've already got fuel taxes in place. So people are accustomed and people clearly do accept fuel taxes. Now, it's probably not very smart then to come in, um, as, as France did a couple, of, uh, a couple of years ago, to say, well, let's increase, uh, let's increase the fuel tax in, in order to meet our, our green goals, our carbon emissions goals. But there are many other ways that we can do this. Um, so we can talk about directing subsidies. We can talk about adjusting subsidies away from inappropriate uh, targets towards more green targets. And people are also convinced and much more, uh, uh, much more you likely to support. More please, yeah. Sure, much more likely to support um, a tax if they know um, where those tax revenues are going. Now, the economists would say that's irrelevant. Um, what's important is the incentive effect of the tax. But from people's point of view, where the taxes go is is very important. And um, so I will finish on a note um, which I think is terribly important and has come up. Um, both in Vinod's presentation and also, also in uh, Sunita's comments, um, which is the question of distribution. So the costs are high and, and who pays them? And it seems to me that we've not got very far in the discussion about this at the national level in any country. Um, and so while this discussion is going on at the international level, really thinking about who's going to pay the costs and how we're going to compensate um, the losers uh, from the energy transition at the national level seems to me part of what's going to be a, a critical factor in whether um, the kinds of carbon reducing policies that we want to see are actually implementable at the national level. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you, Olivia. Actually, when you said that you know, people support action at the national level, immediately thing which came to my mind was whether they will support some taxes. So <laughs> but I'm surprised that people don't really do. We will come to this question again later. Uh, but may I now turn to Lavish for share, who can share his thoughts now? It's never a good idea to go after Sunita and after listening to you, Olivia. It's definitely not a good idea to go after you as well. Uh, but uh, thank you, uh, uh, Professor Thomas. It was, it was a really great experience to just review the book. It's been some time now. And uh, and I got a chance to read it again and uh, before this, and it's really come out very well. Uh, thank you for putting this together. I I, I think this book brings together and a really a, a, a unique and fresh perspective, which I really like, and that is the concept of resilience, which I haven't really seen talked about that much in this whole uh, in this whole domain. People have mentioned it here and there, and and I think I'd like to just talk, take a few minutes, and just talk about that part. And link it to some of my, uh, how do I put it, uh, concerns in how we are going forward. Uh, since we all now realize that there is a climate change, which is probably uh, human being created and it is happening. We know that uh, the poor will be impacted the most of, uh, within countries, across countries. Uh, we know that there is a transition which is occurring in many dimensions. The transition could be because of the climate change and the transitions are because of some human responses to climate change. Now in all of this, there are going to be deep structural changes as we go forward. Now, this is the problem that I'm, I'm, I mean, I, 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 I find myself struggling with as I think about this. Whatever we have tried till now has not worked. So why would anything else work in the future? Because I don't see any difference in the conversations on climate change as we were having, let's say, five or 10 years ago. The difference is only technology, where now we see some more possibilities of perhaps in the, in the energy domain, in the transport domain, and so on. Now, so that's my struggle. And I'm not saying that uh, I'm, I, I'd be very happy to be proved wrong on this, but I don't see 
any grade, either global or national, or at this, or for that matter, even uh, uh, more microeconomic solutions, which are different, which might which give me some cause for hope. But resilience, I think, uh, is an is an interesting concept. If I address this whole issue from the cons from the perspective of resilience at the household level, at the community level at uh, the city level, of course, and at the national and global levels, then perhaps we have something which might bring people together better than, 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 than we have been. And I think, uh, uh, I, I mean, I would encourage you to, I mean, put, write another book uh, <laughs> on just focusing on this particular aspect, because I think there are elements of that in, this, in, the, in the book, but I think there are many other issues that are thrown up which sometimes uh, uh, hide this. This I, uh, what I feel is a is, is is a very important contribution. Now, I'd now like to talk about three other parts here. This problem of prices. As economists, we are all trained, and we all believe, and we all understand how prices work, and it is important to get the prices right to get things working. The problem is high prices reduce the consumption of something when you have alternatives. So if I don't have an alternative to coal in the evenings, and I mean thermal power in the evenings, that's when my RE is not working, then high prices will only lead to inflation. They will not lead to much more. So I think there is a problem with prices. Unless and until we can get an alternative for peak loads, which in India happen to be, tend to be in the evenings, It'd be very difficult to get high prices to actually have an impact on consumption on on the usage of of of, of coal. There's a point that uh, Olivia made on prices of of petroleum products, and essentially, it's very difficult to put carbon taxes over and above fuel taxes. You're absolutely right there; it will be difficult, and uh, it is going to be a very serious mac uh, po political economic challenge uh, uh, to to be able to do that. And of course, if you reduce the fuel taxes and add carbon taxes, then it actually doesn't, <laughs> doesn't really do, do, do the job. So you, we do have a challenge here. So I don't, though I do call for uh, carbon prices, uh, I do see that there's a huge challenge. I don't see them coming about, which means that we are going to have some sort of regulatory or command and control kind of mechanisms through which we'll have to get some sort of a change. And believe you me, I feel that there is no other way of doing that, at least in the short run. And given the fact that we have, we are running across uh, against against a, a, a time bomb here. So, um, so though prices would be great to have, and it's good to talk about, I do feel that there is that there, there are other uh, non-price mechanisms that will be far more critical. I do have one complaint, and that is on this book, and I'm talking about, and that is on natural capital. You mention it. It would be great if 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 we are able to you know talk a lot more about it because let's face it even if we got the emissions right we have a disaster of the expanding human footprint ahead of us uh, and that does need to be addressed uh, of course I mean you do mention it and it is right and and rightly so that natural capital has to be has to be a part of the GDP or at least economic calculation, if not directly at a part of the GDP, at least as national wealth and all our decisions need to be looked at. Uh, though most economists that I talk to seem to agree about it, uh, we make very little efforts in actually doing anything about it. And I think that is really critical if we want to at least limit the expanding human footprint. Um, I don't see I don't see much action that is happening there. And the last uh, is, again, I, I, I feel that global cooperative solutions be very tough for them to work. They, they are not working. We need to find some other method of doing this. Because depending on, uh, on political leaders to play a game which is essentially a prisoner's dilemma, will not get us to end cooperation. There has to be some other other mechanisms that we have to start thinking about. So I think I'm about to run. I'm Oh, I already have run out of time. So I'll stop here uh, more for later. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Lavish. Uh, Vinod, uh, if you can, uh, if you take 
two, three or four minutes to, if you would like to respond to any of the points made by the panelists. Very briefly, I, I very much enjoyed the comments and they enriched the discussion beyond measure. Um, if I could just um, be very selective because I, I happen to agree with just about it, all that is said, uh, uh, but to take up Sunita's point on the scaling up of good ideas, I mean, that is really the crux of the matter. I mean, if, if something works, I mean, you know, in a, even in a, an experimental uh, situation, can we find ways and means to uh, stop the incrementalism and go all out uh, for transformational change to make that uh, more the norm than the exception that you know so again on the how to get there that question remains um, a quick comment on uh, per, uh, the perceptions that olivia rightly mentioned uh, am i right in thinking that the same surveys or complementary ones combined uh, they are telling us now that if you ask the question is there climate change i think the majority would say yes if you ask the question, is the human caused climate change? Um, quite a few would say yes now compared to 10 years ago, but there would be a lot of people saying we are not sure. But if you ask the question, would my country or would my community set aside resources to deal with the problem? That's where the, uh, the change uh, is dramatic. In the US elections right now, it's not even in the top uh, seven issues uh, of concern on what US should uh, act on. And so this, I want to relate back to Sunita's point. Uh, she said this in passing, that um, uh, where we are today, uh, okay, uh, is a result of what has happened. I think it's a big point actually, even though we can't cry over spilled milk, um, what industrial countries do from here on needs to be disproportionately high, right? Because I had a table and for the interest of time, I didn't uh, reproduce it, but it's really telling if you rank countries on total emissions, per capita emissions, emissions per, uh, per GDP, and then accumulated emissions, it's, it's like uh, unbelievably different, right? And why that matters for climate change more than any other issue is because it's the stock of emissions that determines human welfare today, right? And we are stuck with it for decades to come. So in that sense, I wanted to relate it back and saying that that's not a minor point, that it does affect what people, uh, industrial countries should be doing disproportionately from here on as well. Uh, and then um, many other very interesting ones, but. Uh, on Lavish, I mean, uh, you are the first to comment on this book, a draft, I and mean, I feel bad that I sent you uh, a zero draft, but so it, if it has benefited from that, thank you for that. And you made a point at that time, which um, I hope we can do justice, that fundamentally there is a time inconsistency. That is uh, the political uh, life uh, very much differs from the climate life. And uh, those spans being so different, we end up doing things that are suitable for the first, for the next five years and uh, not for the next uh, 20 years. Uh, and a passing comment on uh, carbon tax and the fuel price. I want to say they are quite different. I mean, you can't add them on because the, for the consumer, they are still cost, but the fuel cost is a cost on the fuel, but the carbon is only, going after the carbon content, and that's what you want. And so uh, maybe we should uh, replace the fuel tax with carbon tax, which is what you really want from the emissions point of view. And just, just to completely under, uh, sub agree with the natural capital point that all of you would agree as well, just like the tripod uh, for a camera, we have the physical capital, physical and financial, we have the human and social, and fortunately it's getting more attention than it did 30 years ago. But what about the natural uh, 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 capital? Without that, the tripod collapses. And that's where we are um, with these tipping points and uh, the Dasgupta report. Um, 
Thank you uh, for this chance, Janak. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Vinod. Uh, we'll take up now a few questions from the audience. Uh, the first question is from Atul Arya, but he has not indicated the panelists who should respond to this question, but I will address it too. I, I take the liberty of addressing it to Sunita. Uh, his question is, what is Global South, South willing to do in return for Global North to agree to reduce their fossil fuel consumption and accelerate transition to zero carbon sources when both of these actions would likely impact their pocketbooks and their living standard? Is there a bargain to be had? A fascinating question from Atul. Um, I mean, it is very clear that we need a compact. We need an agreement. And it is in the interest of all countries. It is something very unique. Um, Vinod mentioned this, and I just want to reiterate it. It's the one existential crisis which, has, which is also a great equalizer. I mean, yes, the poor are victims. So so are the rich. And as uh, we pump more and more into the atmosphere, uh, emissions into the atmosphere, we are at a situation where the world is at a tipping point, as we know so correctly said. And this, uh, we are seeing it, whether it's in the wildfires, in the floods, um, which are devastating the rich world as well as the poor world. So the compact is needed. Now, what can this compact? The compact really is about finance at the end of the day. And I think that's the that's really where the conversation should be. And uh, what Atul has also raised, I mean, um, today, uh, for climate finance is not going to the countries who need it. It is not going as concessional finance. Uh, we know you talked about the Pakistan floods. The fact is the money that came for the Pakistan floods came as loans to an already indebted country. What does that mean? So I think this is the time when we need to be able to step up our game. And I am not so if it's possible, at the end of the day, we are in a crisis. We have to find the solutions together. I mean, you know, there is a war and money is found uh, to, uh, to deal with the war. So I cannot believe that we cannot have sure that we can invest in the South uh, with concessional finance to build the energy system. Today, India has to double its energy use between now and 2030. Instead of focusing on full-based power plants, we should be talking about how to augment the new energy system, which is non-fossil fuel, and what will it cost to be able to do so. So I think that's really what compact has to happen. Yeah, thank you, Sunita. Uh, next question is from Halde Strishrao. His question, he, he has also not indicated the panelist uh, you know, who should respond to his question, but I can uh, direct it to Vinod because it relates to his book. He said that there are many, uh, many in the recent period, many disaster, disasters have become totally unpredictable. In this case, how does one determine the type and level of resilience that one should undertake? and the cost of such resilience, particularly given the limited finances of developing economies. We know if you could address this. Thank, uh, thank you, that's a great question. Uh, and I very much agree with Satish that <clears throat> when things are uncertain, uh, perhaps good economics would say, you might want to um, uh, take your bets uh, in a different direction than if you were sure that this is going to happen. So uh, this book is about risk uh, uh, and resilience and uncertainty is a magnified risk where you just don't know where things are going to fall. Whereas in the case of risk, you at least try to uh, claim that you know something. But where I think that argument might, Satish, go the other way is this. Uh, if disasters were totally natural, Yes, Philippines may have 12 
extreme events a year compared to Singapore having half a year. In that sense, they're different, but they are uncertain. You don't know when they'll hit how uh, and how bad it would be. And so that's when, when they are natural, uh, there is a case to wait and see and do quite a lot on adaptation, heavily, 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 right? But when things are human caused climate change variety of disasters, it's definite that they're going to happen because you have identified a reason, it's like a virus causing COVID-19. Um, and so, although you don't know the exact time and uh, details, in fact, uh, winters can get quite hot because of the Arctic, Arctic effect, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. And I, we had this incredible example of so the same country having drought and, uh, um, and uh, floods at the same time, Delhi's experience last this year. But given all of that, nevertheless, the case for mitigation to reduce that overall phenomenon is much clearer. And so on that part, I would say uh, the uh, climate phenomenon gives greater certainty that without action, uh, all bets are off. On adaptation too, but the exact nature might be different, but the need to adapt is absolutely clear. So perhaps more diversified set of skills and capacity. And one example would be in the case of adaptation, you don't know whether Himachal Pradesh will be the one hit hardest or Andhra Pradesh will be hit the hardest. Could there be a pool of resources across the country like Japan is trying to do, uh, both financial, human, and uh, otherwise that can be deployed in different parts of the countries in very short order. And in that sense, although you don't know whether it will hit one state or the other uh, and when, uh, we are prepared for adapting as quickly as possible. So I think the case might be stronger with climate change uh, to plan and plan ahead, both mitigation and adaptation. Yeah, uh, th thank you, you know, uh, for your very beautiful answer. Uh, before we wrap up, I have just one question. I have, I have a context and uh, I have three questions to that context. And uh, I would like each panelist to respond to that. Uh, let me briefly give the context. In the recent G20 New Delhi leaders declaration, it is admitted that global ambition and implementation to address climate change remain insufficient to achieve the temperature goal at the Paris Agreement. That is to hold the increase in the global average temperature to well below two degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial levels. Many people are now skeptical whether we will be able to achieve the temperature goal as set out in the Paris Agreement. An analysis by some researchers has also now indicated that existing nationally determined contributions also suggest that collective ambition needs to be increased if the temperature goal is to be achieved. The UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, which was submitted in 2018, warned that humanity had 12 more years to radically slash greenhouse gases. We are now in 2023 which would mean only seven years to take corrective measures. In this context, uh, I have three different questions and let me first direct my first question to Sunita. Sunita, are you hopeful that the global community will be able to make up for the lost time and that we will be able to achieve the temperature goal as articulated in the Paris Agreement? Uh, would you be able to indicate one or two areas where you feel that the global community has gone terribly wrong with respect to achieving the temperature goal? Janak, that's a zillion dollar question. <laughs> and obviously, um, I think today it is, um, it's, an, it, it's a complex mode. On one hand, you are seeing a lot more impact of climate change. Um, I mean, when I was in Rio in 1992 and we were talking about climate change, far away. And it just seemed like never going to happen in our lifetime. We are seeing it happen. There is huge fear, uncertainty. I think there is a public opinion which is growing across the world, including our world. 
ironically, we are actually doing less today than we even were 10 years ago. And there is a pushback across the world. So tough question. I think where we have really gone wrong is when we moved away from principle rule-based climate regime to, an, um, to the Paris Agreement, which is uh, do what you can as much as you can, don't put pressure on anyone. Um, that regime is really what has made us go wrong. The rule-based regime of the um, Framework Convention, the Kyoto Protocol, and if we had tightened the deterrence, and if we had made sure that created the problem, were forced to comply, I think we would have seen more action. So I am, um, I, I'm not going to tell you I'm not hopeful. I have to be hopeful. We all have to be optimistic. But uh, I am more hopeful of the changes that we can increase than what we can drive globally. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Sunita. You know, my next question is to Olivia. Olivia, what, according to you, uh, the global community could do radically different going forward to make up for the lost time? Uh, it's a context the same what I've given already, yeah. Uh, uh, that's a terribly difficult question too, uh, given given all we've said about the the barriers, the social, political, uh, financial barriers to to taking action. Um, I, I'd like to keep the discussion hopeful, um, and so uh, two two points. I mean, one is that while it may be useful rhetorically to talk about running out of time and to talk about having seven years left. Um, that's not the reality. The reality is that everything that we can do um, to reduce carbon emissions, everything that we can do to uh, to limit temperature rise is important and useful, even if we miss that Paris goal. Um, and even if we do supposedly kind of run out of time, we've not run out of time, we're still going to be living in the world. Uh, and we still need to find ways uh, incrementally uh, to make it uh, uh, to make it a more livable place. In terms of um, effective action, I, I sometimes wonder whether we're not missing some tricks. Um, I heard for the first time yesterday about a an anesthetic gas that's used in hospitals, which has a, a, a carbon footprint which is 100 to 1,000 times higher uh, than another anesthetic gas that can be used for the same medical purposes. And I wonder whether there isn't something like that going on a bit in the actions that we uh, are choosing and pushing forward at, at national level. You might have come across a project drawdown, which was this very a very serious and comprehensive bit of work to look at you know what really would change uh, be the most effective actions to reduce carbon emissions. Um, and in that sort of top ten list are things that um I don't think most people have have thought about, maybe haven't even heard of, um including um you know uh, preventing methane gas leaks from pipelines. Um, so having animals graze amongst woods. Um, and then important behavioral changes like having more uh, sort of plant rich diets and reducing food waste. And it seems to me that enormous progress could be made on these very uh, impactful actions, which aren't appearing in all our discussions about the challenges of, of the energy transition. So I, I think there's more to explore there. Um, and the most impactful actions are probably uh, country specific and that this kind of exercise of identifying what what might work, what might be quick wins, um, is is worth pursuing in every country individually. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's well said, uh, Olivia. Now let me turn to Lavish. Uh, Lavish, do you think that the global political leadership can take some tough decisions for bringing the de derailed train on track relating to temperature uh, temperature goal, and then ensure it's ensuring smooth progress lavish so yeah so i'll spoil the party here because <laughs> as i have said there is going to be no global cooperative solution you'll get no funds from the west and if you get it it's going to be debt which many countries 
many countries, many developing countries at least, should be very careful of taking if at all. Given that, where is the solution to me? And that's, of course, what something that I, I've been thinking about a lot and been, uh, also uh, trying to figure out. I think that the only solution that we have here is some things that have already been stated is a combination of one, behavioral change, command and control kind of non-price uh, measures, and third, technology change. I'll give you some examples, uh, or at least a couple of examples, just to illustrate my point. Uh, renewable energy, at least I'm speaking from an India perspective, is mostly available in the afternoons because most of it is solar in India. Uh, now, a there, are, there are broadly two peaks, which are not there in the afternoon. There's an afternoon peak as well, but in the demand, when we talk about the electricity consumption, there's an early morning peak, an afternoon slight bump, and then in the evening. In the morning, there is a peak because when people get up, all of water supplied in India is for two hours in across Indian cities, and it's only supplied in the morning. That's when the electricity pump goes go on. That's when you don't have renewable energy available. Now, just a movement of water supply from early morning to afternoon could actually reduce the electricity need for early morning when you don't have renewable energy. So that's one example. Uh, Olivia already spoke about a few behavioral uh, ones. Uh, in, elect in, in, in electricity consumption as well, there are a lot of our habits which can very easily reduce the, 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 uh, the electricity consumption at times when you don't have RE available. So I think that's the second uh, part of it. And the third is related to technology. We do need to get storage prices low. Otherwise, we will not make this whole thing work. We know that it is not happening today. We know that somewhere over the next 10 or 20 years, we will have some sort of an engineering solution or a technology solution to storage. Now, that's where we want to put the money. So I feel that rather than asking $100 billion from the United States, I would, I would say use those that money to find a low-cost storage solution for the world. I'll stop here. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Lavish. Now, before I conclude, may I request Dr. Rakesh Mohan if he wants to say anything? Thank you, Janak. You made the mistake of asking me, so I will. Um, <laughs> First, uh, this last point that Lavish made on storage is a very, very critical point uh, because um, the, tran the, um, the uh, uh, transition to renewables will mean that there is both a time of day uh, variation in the availability of uh, energy, both uh, wind as well as uh, uh, solar, but also um, seasonal variation in the supply. And so obviously all of this to work, and if we're promoting EVs and so on, battery storage is going to be the key. And obviously technology is, is going to be very important how that develops. And what I would also add there is that as if, if, we, as, if we, as we need to shift wholesale to, uh, uh, to renewables, then the kind of demand for battery storage will be huge. And you have to look at the availability of the critical minerals and which our colleague in CSEP, um, Rajesh Chadda, has been looking at. And I think this is going to be a very serious problem uh, in terms of availability, but also foreign policy for most countries. It will be sort of like uh, the, the rush for oil and the rush for critical minerals. So that's one. And that uh, we know that I'm afraid you haven't talked about uh, at all, as far as I understand. Two, uh, I would say also what Sunita said in terms of the availability of money, that it is striking how much money is being given to Ukraine, and it's not loans, except, of course, with the IMF money and the World Bank money, but it's huge amounts. And so one can imagine the kind of diversion of any funds available in the world going to Ukraine. But this problem is not going to be just a war temporary problem because as and when, I can't say if, I suppose, as and when the war ends, there's going to be huge reconstruction of Ukraine. 
and a huge amount of air money will go there. And so what remains uh, in terms of, so I think that's a very important point, uh, Sunita, in terms of the availability of international finance. And finally, uh, we know a task for you for your next book. And since you do one every two years, so I'm looking forward to 2025, um, a step-by-step -step guide that it's, you know, we in some senses are quite familiar now, at least among the Congregenti, of what needs to be done by 2050 by the world. What one really needs, uh, to the extent of mitigation, that is probably something like 15 countries only. Uh, and that includes India, China, and the US, and of course the Eurozone as a whole, uh, Indonesia, maybe a few others. But it's only about 10 to 15 countries who really matter on mitigation. It doesn't make any difference in the world if Western Samoa does mitigation. All, the, all of the highly affected countries from climate change have to do adaptation. Uh, of course, they should do mitigation as well, but it makes no difference whatsoever to the world. And it has to be 10, 15, 20 countries that have to really act on mitigation. Therefore, my suggestion for your new book, and I can collaborate with you, CSEP can collaborate with you, Janakaraj, I'm also volunteering, Lavish, uh, to work on this. A step-by-step -step guide from 2025 to 2035, perhaps 10 major countries, what do you need to do? Step by step. I think that really would catch everyone's attention. And if you don't include me as an author, you can give me your royalties on that idea. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Vinod. Thank you very much, uh, Olivia. Thank you very much, Sunita, for really absorbing discussion. Uh, I won't thank Lavish because this is his job as the president of uh, CSEP. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you very much, Janak, for really excellent uh, moderating. I think you moderated all of us pretty well. Thank you. Thank you very much. But I would also like to thank the, all the participants who have, some of them have raised very tough questions for the panelists and the author. And of course, my thanks to the team at the CSEP, which worked hard behind the scenes to make this a success. Thank you very much. Thank you all for participating to, in today's discussion. Thank you. Thank you and best wishes. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.